thanks for uh, making the time here. Um, once again, uh, this is a part of uh, the diverse lecture series we try to organize uh, under the auspices of uh, SEEP, Software Exporters uh, Association of Pune. And uh, this time, uh, we thought uh, we will talk about uh, a topic which on the face of it uh, may be uh, a fairly common one, already talked about. But I think uh, what is interesting today is that uh, our guest speaker is also going to talk about uh, things like uh, not only what software patents are, but uh, what are some of the trends today which are happening, uh, especially in a market like US, which is most uh, dear to uh, software exporters and, and the IT industry. Uh, things keep on changing in this uh, dynamic world and uh, patents certainly are becoming uh, more and more important as India in fact um, uh, sort of starts treading on the path of product development. I think uh, not just the generic knowledge about patents but as to how to implement what are the trends and you know what are the do's, don'ts, what to look for and uh, we requested uh, Neil Sait, our speaker today, to also probably highlight or uh, validate some of these points through some of the case studies, some of the actual experiences. So I think uh, that's the value add we are uh, seeking uh, through this topic. I'm sure it will be beneficial. Uh, <clears throat> Neil Sait uh, is a partner in, uh, how do I call it, law firm or patent firm? Uh, law firm. Law firm, law firm uh, Baker Hostetler. I'm not a law guy, so excuse me for that. Uh, but uh, once again, I think uh, that they're doing some uh, phenomenal work in the areas of patents in a market which is important for us and with some um, fairly impressive uh, client list. So that, that clearly uh, makes him uh, a wanted speaker today. Uh, he has connections to Pune, so naturally he, he knows the, the Indian environment as well. Um, I would also like to introduce uh, Raghavendra Pongshe of uh, Bhate Pongshe. Uh, so they, they are a similar firm in Pune. Uh, Raghavendra has been uh, working uh, on uh, patents uh, for a long time with many Indian firms. And that's where Bhate Pongshe is uh, partnering, one BP partnering with another BH, I would say. <coughs> so th they have a relationship going. So I think not only uh, a peek at what the um, trends in the US market are, but if you have questions from an Indian perspective, we also have Raghavendra over here and you know, both of them together can also give you a better insight into how these things are. So uh, without uh, much ado, I'd like to turn it over. Raghavendra, do you want to say a few words? So Neil said. Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, so I I'm a partner at Baker and Hostetler, which is uh, a law firm in the United States. Uh, it's about 820 lawyers, so very large. Um, we have 11 offices in the United States, and it's a full-service general practice firm. Um, all of the 820 lawyers, I would say maybe 40 to 50 concentrate on IP, um, patents and trademarks and copyrights. And my um, background, uh, I have an engineering degree in chemical engineering, actually. Um, and so I do quite a bit of uh, pharma and chemical patent work. Um, and I did more of that previously. Now, um, you know, there's, there are other uh, people who are closer to the technology, um, and I concentrate more on uh, the broader legal aspect. So for example, just two weeks ago, I completed a trial uh, in um, the federal district court on a software patent. Um, so uh, just because my, my technical background uh, isn't double E or computer science, um, I still find myself being very involved with um, you know, computer uh, patents and software patents and that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm actually going to discuss the patent that we litigated two weeks ago um, as a vehicle and, and as an example for framing our discussion today. Um, I want to talk about some introduction to patents in the US. Um, and so there are some basic requirements for any type of patent, including software patents, which is that the invention must be new, that's novelty, and it must be non-obvious. 
which means that it, it shouldn't just be a mere um, slight improvement or, or, or something like that. And you may have heard in the, in the newspaper the Novartis decision in India this week. Uh, the Supreme Court struck down Novartis's patent because they said, well, this is just an evergreening type of um, uh, just a small improvement that we're not going to grant patent protection on. Um, so that in the U.S. would fall under a not uh, <coughs> obviousness uh, type of problem. And, and we have similar problems in the U.S. that are litigated also. Um, so you've got this requirement of something that the invention should be new, it should be non-obvious, and it should be new and useful. Uh, so that is what we call in the U.S. a utility requirement. So there should be some uh, utility of the, of the invention that, that's actually helpful um, and, and useful. So that's a basic framework of what the requirements are of any patent. And software is no different. It must fall within uh, and must fulfill the three requirements, uh, new and useful, novel, and non -obvious. Um, so let me also talk about, once you have a patent, how do you enforce it? How do you, what do you do with it? Right, so if you have a patent, um, a software patent, let's say, you, uh, and you want to enforce it against an infringer, it, at least in the US, there's two kinds of infringement. There's direct infringement and indirect infringement. Direct infringement means that the person who's practicing the invention, unauthorized, is practicing each and every, they themselves are practicing each part of the patent claim. Then there's also indirect infringement, which comes in two flavors in the United States. Um, there's contributory infringement and induced infringement. Contributory infringement is, for example, let's say the patent claim claims four things. And one person makes one, one person makes another, one person makes a third, and one person makes a fourth. Then together they're contributing to infringe that patent claim. So that's a contributory uh, infringement. And then induced infringement is a second kind of indirect infringement. And in induced infringement, somebody is encouraging somebody else to, uh, to infringe the patent. So for example, uh, I can think of a non-software example, which is, let's say that there's a, uh, a stent, a medical device stent, um, and it's a method of using that stent. Well, th the person who has manufactured that stent may not necessarily be infringing the patent, but the doctor who's practicing that method of using that catheter or stent <coughs> might end up infringing the patent, because the way of the patent language may be a method for first inserting the catheter, then uh, you know, pushing the balloon through, uh, those kinds of things. So the manufacturer, in that case, wouldn't be infringing the patent because the manufacturer is not doing those steps. But the doctor, who is using the medical device, would be induced to infringe. Okay? Now, bringing it back to software patents, um, you may be familiar with Amazon's one-click patent. Um, and essentially, Amazon has this uh, feature on their website that you can purchase something just with one click. So you've pre-filled in all of your credit card information, your delivery address, all that information. And it's stored with Amazon. They have a patent, believe it or not, in the United States that covers this one click buying. So that you're already logged in, you're already registered, your credit card information is already stored, delivery address is already stored, one click. And that method of purchasing online is covered by Amazon's one-click patent. It's very controversial because you may be thinking to yourself, how can that be patentable? We'll take a look at that. Um, and, and then who is the infringer? So let's say Amazon has this uh, patent that covers this. And let's say somebody else comes along, eBay, uh, and they also have a one-click purchasing scenario. Depending on how the patent claim is written, um, it may either be eBay who's directly infringing, and remember my description of what direct infringement is, meaning that they're practicing the claims, or there may be some kind of indirect infringement <coughs> taking place 
in the combination between eBay and the user. And it all depends on how the claim language of the patent is written as to who is liable. And so that is that is a big deal in the United States right now. And, and later on, I'll um, discuss some cases where that is being discussed right now. OK, so some examples of software-related inventions are these. And these are, these are some of the more common uh, I went through the U.S. Patent Office's uh, current filings, and these are some of the more common um, types or classes of patents that are being filed, patent applications. Features for social networking, by and large, uh, are, are the main um, contributor of the software-related inventions that are being filed. Uh, no doubt about that. So anything that you know works with Facebook or Twitter, um, those kinds of add-on features are very, very popular um, as subject matter that's being filed uh, today in the United States. E-commerce solutions, uh, I think the Amazon one-click patent falls into that category. Insurance and financial software, operating systems, debuggers and compilers. Now. Um, Remember that this actual software code itself in the United States falls under copyright law. Okay. Here in, in, in the United States uh, patent scheme, the actual code is not written into the, into the patent. Rather, a description of what it does <coughs> is written in, in, into the patent. And that's where the ambiguity comes from. Um, as you all know, um, once somebody sees uh, a certain software feature, it's relatively easy for, for somebody else to come and write code uh, to do it. And so that's why the it's quite a limited protection to actually get a copyright on the actual code. Because you know any any um, experienced software programmer can achieve the same functionality using a different uh, you know different implementation. Uh, and so the, the, the protection afforded by the copyrights for the actual code is quite limited. And so that's why then you start looking at uh, the patent coverage instead. Another controversial um, type of software patents uh, is what's called the business method patents, um, which are the, the methods of doing something, and specifically doing some sort of business. Um, they're highly scrutinized by the, the, the patent office um, and their long delays. So let me give you an example. Um, a method of, let's say, uh, an, a, a trading, a stock trading algorithm might be um, an example of that. Um, E-commerce e may fall into the same thing, depending on what's, what exactly is, is covered. Right. Um, and the controversy lies in that sometimes these business methods, it's just somebody's idea. There's nothing tangible there. He's just, he's just saying, okay, well, uh, first I'm gonna advertise my product, and then people are gonna come in, and then they're gonna buy it. I mean, that's just, it's just this completely obvious, non-new um, thought process um, that people were getting patents on. <clears throat> I'm obviously exaggerating the simplicity of it, um, but there, are, there were um, patents Granted for methods of you know training horses, um, things like this um, that that are now really being uh, scrutinized very very carefully. So there's there's been an absolute growth in software patent filings in the U.S. This goes up to uh, 2009 uh, because that's the last reliable data. There's just this is all from the U.S. Patent Office uh, data, um, and so their publishing is a little lagging. <laughs> but you can see the big, you can see the trend um, over the last thirty years, and especially high growth in social networking. This is what I was mentioning earlier. Um, if you look at the applications, are far out, uh, just exploding really. 
Um, and again, these numbers are taken directly from the U.S. Patent Office. Um, so you can see that in the next few years, um, these applications, again, this data only goes up to 2010, but it's likely that the applications were, that were filed in 2008 and 2009 um, are either granted or getting ready to be granted. Um, three years is a typical time frame for uh, patents in the United States. Okay, let me pull up as an example This is a, a copy of the patent that I've been thinking about for a long, long time, probably about six years, uh, and that we ended up litigating um, two weeks ago uh, in the United States in federal district court. And for those of you who haven't, who have never seen a U.S. patent, um, there's the title, the number. Here's the title. Here's the number. Um, and then there's some uh, bibliographic information. There's information about which other patents were considered before this patent was granted. There's an abstract, which is just one paragraph long, that um, summarizes the invention. There are drawings. This, sometimes there are a lot of drawings. Flow charts. And these are algorithmic flow charts um, that are just kind of translated into English that describe what the process is, uh, what the process is. Then there's a background of the invention, which describes what the problem was that this patent solves. A summary of the invention, and then a detailed description of the invention. And the patent concludes at the end with the claims. Here, and there are numbered paragraphs that talk about the claims at the end. And the claims are what define the scope of the patent. And you may have heard me talk uh, a few times. I've mentioned, well, it depends on what the claims actually cover. And so I'm going to use this patent to um, <coughs> describe and illustrate um, how a good software patent is written. Uh, but let me tell you what this patent covers first. It covers uh, remote access of one computer from another computer. And um, you know there are many ways to remotely access a computer. But this one uh, was filed in the year 2000. Um, and it covers not a VPN type system, but um, something that just ordinary people can use. Uh, if you've ever used a system like uh, Citrix's GoToMeeting or GoToMyPC, it's that kind of technology that you can just be sitting in the airport with an internet connection and access your home computer as if you're sitting in front of it. Even though the home computer is behind a firewall uh, or it has a dynamic IP address um, or anything like that. So today, um, this kind of invention is, is very commonplace, that this technology is used all the time. This patent was filed in, like I said, in 2000, and uh, the invention actually was uh, conceived of in 1997. So if you take yourself back to then, um, nobody else was doing this in this way back then. So this patent um, fulfills the, the three requirements, utility, is it's useful for something. Novelty, because it's new, it's, again, remote access of one computer was well known, VPNs were well known. This particular method was not well known. Um, 
and, and then non-obviousness as well. Uh, I'm going to tell you one more thing about this patent because uh, it'll help explain the claims when I go, go through them. The way this invention works is the home computer that's behind the firewall and that might, might have a dynamic IP address intermittently sends a message to a server computer that has a static IP address on the, um, on the internet. There, thereby, this, the server computer knows the IP address, even though it may change, of the home computer. Then, and, and even though it's behind a firewall, the server computer is able to uh, send a response message back because the personal computer um, at home set the outgoing message. So it's able to traverse the firewall that way. Then, if you're at the airport, you don't connect to your home computer, you connect to the server. You connect to the server because it has a static IP address. So that's, that's easy to do. And then the server already knows um, where the, the home computer is by virtue of that intermittent message that the home computer is sending. That's, in a nutshell, the invention of this patent. And you'll see why it's important in a second. <clears throat> So I gave you that description because I'm going to go back to the patent and walk through the claims and, and talk about what are best practices for software claims in US patents. Um, but here are some guidelines to remember. The US Patent Office looks for claims to be tied to a particular machine or transform a physical article into a different state or thing. And there was a big case um, a few years ago that went to the Supreme Court 